Good evening, everybody. Back from our little bit of a break, and we're going to start with class number seven in the Epistles of John. So we are at the end of chapter three, so we're going to get to the conclusion of chapter three and possibly touch a little bit on chapter four tonight. Um, I hope you're all ready to go. Uh, so let's start in chapter three, verse 16. Now we get to a new sort of word. And we're going to see this one a couple times here. Hereby perceive. Or here's how we know. And there's some things that we do know. And so this one is hereby perceive we the love of God. And we talked about up there about loving one another. We talked about the love of the brethren. We talked about the world hating us. Here's how we understand. Here's how we see the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us. Just like it says in John 3.16, we're going to hit that later, but for God so loved the world that he gave. Because of the love of God, he gave his only begotten son. Because of the love that he had, Jesus laid down his life. This is how we see it. This is what divine love is. It lays down its life. And this is very, very, very important in understanding 1 John. This is how we perceive it. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. When we say that we love the brethren, when we say we love one another, when we say we do that, are we laying down our lives? What does that mean? I mean, we all understand it when somebody dives in front of a car to push a baby out of the way or somebody, you know, gets in front of a bullet or something like that. We hear these stories, but most of us don't run into that on a daily basis. We don't see that very often in our life. But the reality is we lay down our lives for the brethren because what are we doing? First off, we're praying for one another. Second, we're giving to one another. We see our brother have need is what it comes up right now. Whoso has this world's good, you've got something of this world, and you see your brother has a need, and you shut up your bowels of compassion from him, how does the, the love of God dwell in you? It's, it's, it is the evidence for you to look at your life and say, do I give? Do I see a need and do I try to meet it? Um, let's read a few scriptures. John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's it. Loving the brethren. This is how we do it. Mark 12, 29. Jesus said unto him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like it. It's namely this. You will love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Here it is. This is the same thing that's being talked about. These are the commandments of God. They're wrapped up in love. They're wrapped up in, in forsaking your own way and doing it God's way, which means in all humility, in all brokenness, in all um, submission to him, giving to one another, loving one another, meeting the needs of one another. It's so hard because in our world we're taught, nobody's going to meet mine, why is nobody taking care of me? And so we have this idea that if we don't hold on to what we have, that we're not going to be taken care of. God's here to tell us, you give, and it will be given to you. You give. And people say, well, I'm just not certain that's going to happen. Well, you know, take a step of faith. Begin to do it. Begin to give. And watch how God meets your needs in incredible ways. So he says here, this is how we perceive the love of God. He laid down his life for us. Why? Because this is love, as even as he says, the first commandments. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Then he said, if you see, have this world's good and you shut up your bowels of compassion. We can read that same thing in James chapter 2, verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what a profit is it? Even so, faith, if it does not have works, is dead, being alone. Your faith, your walk with God, your love for the brethren is going to have an outworking of it, an outworking of caring for one another. 
And this is very important for us to see. It's very important for us to understand. You walk before God, cry out to God, and don't love just in with your mouth, with your tongue, but in deed and in truth. So here's our second hereby. Hereby know we, know we know that we are of the truth. You want to know you're of the truth, and you will assure your heart before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence towards God. So let's talk about the truth. There's some great scriptures on the truth. We understand um, that we're supposed to walk in spirit and in truth. We understand that truth makes you free. We understand that Pilate didn't know what truth was or what is truth, you know. It's just kind of confused. But let's look at a few. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 14. And let's see uh, what Jesus said. Uh, you know, this is the Word of God to us. The Word, Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Very nice. If you just look down in verse 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. What is grace and truth? Well, just to give it to you simply, Grace is the empowerment of God to do all the works of God. Truth is the word of God that's been given to us, that which changes us, makes us right, and shows us the way to go. It is the way of truth. Let's look in uh, John 14, same book. Skip down to verse or chapter 14 and verse 6. Let's see another one on truth. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You want to know the truth? His name is Jesus. We skip down to verse 17, that same chapter. You start with 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. We've talked about that before, but here it is. You want to love God, keep his commandments. And I will pray the Father. He will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. So Jesus said, I am the truth, and he's given to us the spirit of truth. Let's look at one more, 1526. When the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds in the Father, he will testify of me. And the outworking of that is, and you also shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Look at that. Truth. Hereby know we're of the truth and will assure our hearts before him if our heart condemn us or if our heart condemn us not. So we need to understand the heart. Absolutely. We need to understand it. Um, let's look at the first step in truth. For everyone that does evil hates the light. And will not come to light. Remember we read that at the beginning of this. That the light was manifested and people loved their darkness rather than light. So they would not receive the light. And so if you do evil, you're hating the light. And you don't come to the light. Lest your deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light. That his deeds may be manifested. That they are wrought in God. This goes back all the way to the beginning of chapter 2. Talking about. Um, the fact that we have an advocate. The f being that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, does not give us a license to sin. And we've, we've hit that very hard. But look at what happens here. When you do the truth, when the truth is in you, what do you do? You come to God to come to the light so that your deeds can be made manifest. You say, Father, see if there be any wicked way in me. You want to see the, the manifest work outworking of the deeds of the Father in your life. This is the truth. This is what it is. It's the humility. It's the acceptance. The, the difference between those that come to the light and those that don't is those that come to the light come and say, reprove me, correct me, show me, I will do right. Just point me in the direction. And in that honest and sincere heart, God Jesus, with his grace and his truth, will shine the light of truth and say, I have somewhat against you. 
because you have done these things. You have tolerated this. You have allowed that. And he comes to us and he says, I want to correct you. And we come to the light and say, Father, correct me. And I'm a son. It's evidence that you're a son. So when we say that our heart condemns us not, doesn't mean, you know, well, I committed sin and I didn't feel so bad. No, it's when you go to God and you know that he's taken it away. You know that he's the one who get who reproves your deeds and corrects you and works his outworking is the working of God that which is wrought in God that's all in John 3:20 this is how the truth works so let's look at the heart a little bit more let's understand it a bit i'm just going to read some scriptures that are thrown here in the notes just looking at the heart um Matthew 24 Jesus talks about the heart in this way blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. In other words, being watchful and waiting. Truly I say to you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. Look, people aren't walking around with signs going, the Lord's delayed his coming. It's in the heart. And shall begin to do what? Evil. Because, see, it doesn't matter. God's not paying attention. He doesn't know what I'm doing. He doesn't know what's going on. So my Lord delays his coming. So it begins to what? Smite his fellow servants. Well, that's not loving one another. Eat and drink with the drunken. People say, well, that doesn't hurt anybody but me. Yeah, it does. It does. The Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he does not look for him, an hour he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint from Point him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what if in my heart I have said, well, you know, I just I'm gonna, I just want to do these things and I just want to commit this sin or I just want to be involved in these things and I don't think it's so bad anyway. And the Spirit of God is telling me, no, you need to stop that. You need to not do that. Well, if I don't submit to him and if I don't agree with him, What's going to begin to happen to me? I'm going to begin to say in my heart, well, he's delayed his coming anyway. It's in the heart. It's the heart. This is why so often we talk about passions. Do we have a passion? Now, there's many people that will preach on it, will teach on it, will talk about it. But you have to know in your own heart, do I have a passion for the things of God in my heart? Because if I don't have a passion for the things of God, then I have, I'm in danger. And my heart can condemn me because I'll begin to say, even as this evil servant, well, you know, it doesn't matter so much anyway. It matters. Jesus wants you to be an overcomer. All right, let's just look at another one. Blessed is that servant, verse seven, verse 46 of Mark 7. Blessed is that servant who is Lord when he comes shall find so doing. Truly I say unto you that you should make him ruler over everything. But if the evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays, he begins to do what? He begins to do sin. So we just got another one of those. Um, if you go up from there, Mark 7, 20, he said, That which comes out of the man, that defiles the man from, for, from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Why? Because they have a heart that is wicked, the wicked heart. So if your heart is wicked, what's going to happen? You're going to do these things. It's evidence to you that something's wrong with your heart. But if your heart is right, if you're doing the truth, if you happen to do something like that, if you get deceived into doing something like that, if you fall back into the form of conversation, what do you do if any man sin? We have an advocate with the Father. He's Jesus Christ the righteous. We repent. It's important that it's the heart that matters. God judges the heart. I've, I've heard people on my life, well, God knows my heart. Yeah, and you ought to be really afraid because he really does know your heart. He really does. He knows where, out of where things proceed. And what is the evidence of what's in your heart? The things that you do. So let's look at another one. Romans 2.29, he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Notice that. It's not the praise of men. 
We're really not interested in the praise of men. The praise of men will get you nowhere. It might make it look like you've got something in this world, but the praise of men is not what we're after. But he's one that is one inwardly. Somebody who's a person of God is one who's one inwardly. Circumcision is of the heart. It's the body of the sins of the flesh being removed by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Coming in and removing all that sin and giving you a new heart. That new heart that you've received, that is, that is valuable. Um, Romans 10, uh, 9 and 10, you, you know the scripture. It talks about if you believe in the heart, it's, it's, it's speak with your mouth. It's these things. It's what comes out of your mouth. You begin to proclaim Jesus your Savior. You begin to proclaim Jesus the King of the world. You begin to proclaim Jesus the one who took my sin away. You begin to proclaim Jesus God forever. I mean, you just begin to proclaim these things. That's evidence that you have a sincere, a true heart. Ephesians 3.17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to do all of these things and comprehend all these things. Because it begins with getting a new heart. So we see what a wicked heart will do. Out of a wicked heart will proceed the words that are not convenient, the things that are not good. We don't want a wicked heart. How do I get a new heart? I get circumcised in heart. I get, I get to God and I choose the truth and I choose to walk with him. But when I do the truth, I'm going to come to the light. He's going to correct me. This is going to happen. Because every son that he receives, he corrects them. So let's look at Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. In light of John chapter 3, we're going to do. But let's do start with Galatians 2, 11. And let's look a little bit more of the heart. Um, there is this word, this word that, that we're looking at in terms of condemn, okay? And, you know, how, how we, we say it, because it says here, if our heart condemn us or if our heart condemn us not. And so what, what is that talking about? And that word there in Galatians chapter 2, 11. Um, I want to get this right. It's the end of Galatians 2.11. He says this, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be condemned. Whoa. That's really what it says. It's the same word when we talk about here, that if our heart condemn us or our heart condemn us not. So if our heart blame us or our heart blame us not, because here he says he was to be blamed. It's the same thing. It's the, it's the, it is the condemnation that comes because we're doing not the truth. So we know, we know that the truth comes to make us right. Peter here had fallen from what he knew to be true. And so Paul had to rebuke him openly, which is, I mean, it's pretty intense when you think about it. So when your heart condemns you, it's because you're doing something that is wrong. Let's get this right. You're doing something that is wrong. So when he talks about, beloved, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all things. D don't think, if you begin to see it, don't think God doesn't see it. And if, you, if your heart does not condemn you, if you, if, you, if you see nothing that you've done that's wrong, then have a heart of humility saying, that's a perfect heart, saying, oh, Father, show me. And have confidence to go to God, Father, show me. I want to know your ways. It's so much better to live right. It's so much better to do things correctly. It's so much better to live in righteousness. It is so far superior to unrighteousness. So when we say this, people say, well, my heart doesn't condemn me. But out of your mouth, out of your life is proceeding evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and whatever. And it's just, this is what's coming out. Drunkenness, lasciviousness, 
I'm not condemned. I can watch that whatever it is. I can do that whatever it is. No, you can't, really. God, in his love and his mercy, will call you to repentance. He'll draw you to repentance. That's what it means when we talk about a, a heart that condemns us not. One of the most horrible places to be is to be living in all of this wickedness and say, my heart doesn't condemn me. That is, I, it, it's intense. But, but this is going out there right now. This is what people are, are teaching. So that compound word, that word that we use here for condemn, is only found in a couple of places. 1 John 3 and in Galatians 2.11. It's the same basic word. And it's telling us we need to be corrected. Well, Lord, come and correct me. Or as my pastor would say, I'll take my now, which is a much better way to be than waiting for the judgment day. So, let me go back up here. You want to know you're, you're of the truth and assure your heart? Make sure your heart does not condemn you. If that which proceeds out of your mouth, out of your heart, is that which is evil, recognize right away you have need. Praise God for an advocate. Praise God for the gift of repentance. Get on your face and cry out to God. So verse 22. Whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. Now we've talked about this before, this whole concept. And we do those things that are pleasing in sight. Why? Because we choose to walk in the light. Because we choose to walk in the truth. And this is his commandment. Now what we're about to get here at the end of the 23 and 24 is this is the conclusion of all of the first three chapters. And it is the linchpin on which we're going to spin to go to the next section. Okay? He's laid out what it is. Here's what you have. If you do this, you do that. If you have love the truth, you, this is what happens. If you, if you uh, love me, you keep my commandments. If you uh, love the brethren, it's evidence that you, you have the love of God in you. All of these things that he's been talking about, it comes down to this. Here's the whole thing put together. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. And he that keeps his commandments dwells in him. Remember, we're talking about dwells in him. And he in him, so the mutual indwelling. I dwell in God, he dwells in me. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given us. This is how we know. It's by the Spirit. And then he's going to go into, in chapter 4, he's going to start talking about the Spirit. He's going to begin to explain to us the Spirit. So, but let's just focus on this summary here. As you go through and look at the first three chapters of 1 John again, that we should believe, love one another, as he gave us a commandment to do, and if we keep his commandments, we're to have a mutual indwelling. And hereby we know that we have this mutual indwelling by the Spirit which he has given us. That right there, that's it. That's everything. That's everything we've been talking about all rolled into just a couple of sentences. It's pretty, pretty powerful. Absolutely amazing. This is the first time in 1 John that we hear believe. Right? It's the first time. Um, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. First instance in John where he says, you should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus. This is where you begin. You begin, you begin with, I believe. And out of that, there's an outworking of love. You don't need anybody to teach you how to do that. As he gave his commandment, and he keeps his commands, and you dwell in him. If you're not keeping his commands, you're not dwelling in him. It's just that way. So let's look at Hebrews 11, 6 real fast. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We saw up here um, where he says this, where he says, by faith. So let me go back up and just so I can read it. Um, uh, where am I? Um, 
I just missed the scripture. I had it here. I read it to you. But you remember what he's saying. He's just talking about um, Ephesians 3.17. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all. So there, that Ephesians 3.17 is the same thing when he says, sitting here, saying that we should believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and love one another as he gave his commandment. And then you add that Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, because if you come to him, you got to believe that he is. And then what happens? He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When you seek him by faith, that's knowing that the word of God is true, believing that God is for you, he's not against you, believing that he loves you, believing that you want to walk with him. As you begin to do that, he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The person who's not doing the truth does not diligently seek him. The person whose heart really should condemn them is the one who's not diligently seeking him. There's going to be evidence in your life that you're diligently seeking him. There's going to be evidence in your life that you have turned your heart towards God. So this believing is not just, I believe on Jesus, isn't that great? Yee, will be for me. No, there's going to be a love one for another. And there's going to be a mutual indwelling and there's going to be the manifestation of the Spirit. That's what's going to happen. And if that's not in your life, guess what? You have an advocate, go to Jesus. Cry out to him. Say, Father, if there be any wicked way in me, show me. And then say, Lord, I'll let you correct me. Correct me, O oh God. Correct me. Okay, so that's the end, the conclusion in chapter 3. But in, we've, now been, we've now been seated with this idea. Hereby we know that he is. we have a mutual indwelling by the Spirit which he's given us. We're going to see a lot of stuff that goes on in, uh, you know, as we've looked at John 14, 15, 16, 17, a lot of talk about the mutual indwelling, John 15 in particular, and we spent a lot of time on that one. Um, that mutual indwelling, what is the result of it? What? How does it work? And that's what the next part is going to talk to us. So we're going we're gonna to touch on some stuff here in uh, chapter 4 as we move on to 1 John chapter 4. Okay, beloved, don't believe every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they're of God. For many false prophets are gone out into the world. There it is we got to be careful. There are many false prophets. Many. This has been a problem at all times, in all places, all of God's people. There have always been false prophets. And we need to try the spirits, whether they're of God. Verse 2. Hereby. Here's that hereby again. Hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now, let's think about the context here, where this comes from. We just talked about the fact that if you keep his commandments, you're going to have a mutual indwelling. Jesus in me, me, and me in him. And we're going to know that this mutual indwelling is happening by the Spirit. He says, don't believe every spirit, but try the spirits, because many false prophets are gone in the world. And here's how you know the Spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So is that to confess that Jesus Christ was on the earth 2,000 years ago? Is that, is that what we're talking about? If you confess that Jesus Christ was on the earth 2,000 years ago, well, I tell you, the devils believe, and they tremble about it. It's not just that. I'm going to tell you that the context is very, very clear. He's talking about Jesus dwelling in me, in my flesh. If I confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that's of God. But every spirit that does not confess that he's come in the flesh is not of God. When Jesus is someplace far, far away, when Jesus is up in heaven, Jesus is locked away over here, Jesus is something that's far away from me. 
That's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God comes and is saying to us, if you believe on him, the outworking will harm that which you know and no man needs to teach you to love one another, and you will keep his commandments because you do the truth and you come to the light, and you'll know this manifestation by the Spirit. So the first thing is to know that Christ dwells within you. That's what it meant to be born again. And we might say, but oh man, I've done so many things wrong. How can that be if God Christ dwells within me? Well, look, don't try to figure it all out. Don't become a philosopher and sit around trying to mess with words, wrestling things to your own destruction. Just begin to believe and speak the word as God wrote it and say, okay, Jesus Christ come in my flesh. I believe that by faith. Ephesians 3.17 that was forgetting, by faith, okay? This is how we begin to, to walk with him. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, the one that says, no, Jesus does not dwell in you. And you've heard about it, and it's now in the world. So let's look a couple of times, a couple of things here. I just want to look at false prophets, just so that you understand. There's a lot of people that by their words, they're out there, and they're deceiving many, deceiving. Matthew seven fifteen. If you turn there, uh, it says this, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. So they look like a sheep. They're wearing sheep clothes. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves. You will know them by their fruits. you know them by their fruits. What, is, what does the mutual indwelling bring? The fruits of God. That's what they bring. You can't bear fruit except you abide in the vine. If you're not, if Jesus not come in you and you're in him, then you're not abiding in the vine. It's very simple. And so why are there evil fruits coming forth from people? Because they're not abiding in the vine. Do you gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Just as it said right here. This is, how, this is how you know. You want to know a false prophet? By the fruits. There's a bunch of other scriptures on it. I gave you some things. There's a, a lot of talk about fruits in the end times. Um, there's a few things in Revelation about it. Acts 13.6 was this false prophet called Bar Jesus. You can read about him. But let's look at a few others. Luke 6, 26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now that's pretty intense. You think about that. When the prophet speaks the word, guess what happens? There are going to be some or many who are going to fight against it, who are going to refuse it, who are going to attack him for it, who are going to call him the evil one. That's what's going to happen. You get out and you speak the truth, and there's going to be many going to be real upset with you. And they're going to call you names and attack you and do all sorts of stuff to you that you don't like. And in some places, they'll just come and start beating you up and killing you, throw you jail or whatever else they do. So woe to you when all men speak well of you. <laughs> For so did their fathers do the false prophets. You want, to, you want to see that. You want to understand that. 2 Peter 2, one. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. They're going to bring in these lies, heretical opinions, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall fall their, follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. In other words, God is not slack. He's going to take care of the false prophets. He's, going to, he's already judged them. You want to be very careful that it's not you. So what's the first thing that you need to do? 
Here's this. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit, let me just say it this way, that confesses the mutual indwelling is of God. That's it right there. And every spirit that doesn't confess that is not of God. And it becomes fairly obvious what's going on with people. Now, many have been falsely taught. I was talking to some people today about the fact that it's such a tragedy that so few people that call themselves the people of God have spent enough time in the Word that they begin to know what it says and are so honest about it that they begin to cry out to God that what they know it says would become a reality in their life. They just don't believe much of it. They're not sure. They've never seen examples of it. You'll hear the common refrain, well, that's not my experience, or that's not the experience of the church, or that's not the experience of my Uncle Joe, or that's not the experience of whoever. We have all these things that people say, but are we going to yield ourselves to the opinions of men trying to say something that's going to make everybody speak well of us? Or are we going to yield ourselves to the ways of God? False prophets will begin to speak things that are not of God. They'll begin to say things that God never said. They'll begin to contradict the scripture. They'll begin to say things against it. And oftentimes they look like they're sheep. They're just questioning. They're just wondering. It's just so hard. Why, why is it so hard? And why did those Christian people treat me so badly? Well, I don't know. Every situation is fairly unique. But there is something that is really understood. The love of God is there for you. God's love will come and enfold you. And if you believe it, then you will not spend your time worrying about how somebody loved you, but you will spend your time worrying about how you can love somebody else. That'll be the manifestation. So when the manifestation is you're whining over the fact that somebody didn't treat you right, it's an evidence to you it, from your heart that you missed something somewhere. And you need to go back to the first principles being to say, Oh, Father, fill me with your love. Lord, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you died for me. Jesus, I thank you you sent you Holy Spirit. I thank you that you've given me this mutual indwelling. All I have to do is believe on Jesus, call upon his name. I repent of my sin. Father, wash me in the blood. It's just that simple. It's so easy. And as you do that with a true heart, you come before God with a true heart, he'll change you. He'll give you grace and truth to lead you. So yes, there's false prophets. Do we need to be afraid of them? No, we just need to know how to tell what they are. Is it my job to walk around labeling everybody by my, by my assessment? False prophet, false prophet, false prophet. Most of them are just parroting things they heard from somebody else. The person with the greater condemnation is the teacher, the leader, the pastor, the whatever we want to call them this month, that leads people astray and takes away from them these truths of the Word of God. We don't want to be those people. Absolutely not. So, um, let's go um, just a little bit further. Um, you are of God. Of God, little children. And you have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Remember, we just talked about how the context of this thing is talking about the mutual indwelling. You're of God, little children, and you've overcome them. Why? Because Jesus dwells in you. That's why. It's the only reason. So if I speak that Jesus doesn't dwell in me, if I act as if Jesus is far away, if I act as if I'm on my own here, I'm not going to do so well. I'm not going to be an overcomer. Who overcomes? Who is the overcomer? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They're of the world. They, therefore, they speak of the world. And the world hears them. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. And he that is not of God does not hear us. Know we the, hereby 
Know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there it is, right there. You want to know the difference. It says, it, 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 this is how we know it. Why? Because they're overcomers. Because greater is he that's in you. If they're walking around saying, well, there's no Jesus dwelling in me, saying that he's not come to dwell in you or in me, they're of the world. They speak of the world. Everything is judged by their own mind. Everything is judged by their own perceptions. I mean, we can just look around and recognize how big a world it is. Who are you to say you even know what's going on in most of the world? You know, we sit and watch the news and act like we're experts. We don't know. We just, we have no idea what is motivating most people. Yes, there's some things that seem obvious. There's things that we think that we understand. But the reality is, you don't know. Speaking of things you know not, this is what the world does. They speak of the world, and the world hears them and goes, Ooh, so smart. Ooh, so amazing. Ooh, such an understanding. No, we're of God. And if you know God, you hear us. Why? Because we speak the word of God. If you're not of God, you don't hear us. Why? Because you don't hear the word of God. And this is how we know the spirit of truth, spirit of error. Remember, we're talking about, beloved, judge the spirits. Don't, don't, don't accept every spirit. He says, don't believe them all. We've got to start knowing the difference. What's the difference? First of all, they've got to confess the mutual indwelling. That's, that's the first thing. Second of all, there's got to preach overcoming. If we're not preaching that you can overcome sin, what are we doing? Because, because of this mutual indwelling, because greater is he that is in you than he that is up in the world. Do you hear that very clearly? He's telling us, how do we overcome the world? By Christ Jesus dwelling on the inside of me. Well, how does he dwell on the inside of me? By faith. I believe his word. I come to the truth. Am I going to be corrected? Yes. Am I going to bear fruit? Yes. And if I'm bearing fruit, it should be good fruit because I'm dwelling in the good vine. So here's how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, verse 7, let us love one another. For love is of God. Everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. This is it. So I, I said that I'm going to get to this. In the notes here is John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You hear verse 9. Here's the manifestation of the love of God toward us. Going all the way back to where we started. When you talk about how do we know the love of God? Because he gave himself for us, right? Because God sent his only begotten son to the world. God so loved the world, 3.16 of John, that he gave his only begotten son. That what? that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, how are you going to not perish? That you might live through him. Send his only begotten son of the world, that we might live through him, have everlasting life. Why? We have a mutual indwelling. Why do we have a mutual indwelling? Because we keep his commandments. Why do we keep his commandments? Because we believe on the name of his son Jesus and we begin to love one another. This is how we began. This is where we started in this thing. So hereby we perceive the love of God. He laid down his life for us. Hereby we know we're of the truth because our heart tells us. It's what comes out of our heart that tells us. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we do what is pleasing in his sight. Everything is summed up here in 23 and 24. You keep his commandments, you dwell in him, and he abides in us. And because he abides in us, we can be an overcomer. Be careful. Here's how you know the Spirit of God. They confess the mutual indwelling. You are of God, and hereby you know the Spirit of truth, verse 6, and the Spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. This is how 
we do this. He was manifested towards us, the love of God towards us, because he sent his only begotten son in the world that we might live through him. So I hope you see all of that. I hope you understand it. You can follow it. Be blessed in it. Next time we'll get moving into uh, starting at verse 10 of um, chapter 4. And we'll dig deep into uh, the rest of chapter 4. I mean, it is really, really powerful. Um, out of tonight, I just want you to really begin to see that this mutual indwelling and the confession of it is not a light thing. It is a very, very big thing. And you need to confess it, believing it, not based upon the evidence around you and what other people tell you about you, but of what God said about you. And you begin with that heart of truth that comes to God saying, Lord, shine your light upon me. Show me if there be any wicked way in me. Correct me. Make my way right. Make my way blessed. Make me a man of truth, a woman of truth. Let me do the things that you ask me to do. Father, I want to be pleasing in your sight. I want to be an overcomer. You know, only the overcomers are going to live with God. Only the overcomers are going to dwell with Him. Only the overcomers are going to be with Him forever. Well, how are they going to overcome? They're going to overcome by Jesus in them. Because God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. If we don't confess that there's a mutual indwelling, then we can't even get there. Can't even start. It has to begin with this. So bless you all, and we'll see you next time.